ICQ Podcast episode 413, Portable Radio Ops Antennas. Well, hello fellow amateur ham radio enthusiasts and welcome to this 413th episode of the ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast. Supported this episode by Patrick Bean, John Reese, Golf Whiskey Zero, Juliet Romeo Foxtrot and Robert Swain, along with our monthly annual subscription donors. In this episode, we join Martin, M1MRB, Chris, Mike Zero, Tango, Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra, Golf Lima, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3, Bravo, to discuss the latest Amatown Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6PRA, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is looking at portable antennas suitable for SOTA, POTA, and hiking operations. Well, as always, it's your very kind support that keeps your ICQ podcast advert-free and produced every fortnight. And we work on what's called the value for value model, i.e. if we uh, provide some value for you, uh, it's great if you can return it back to us. And uh, Patrick Bean, John Reese, uh, Golf Whiskey Zero, Juliet, Romeo Foxtrot and Robert Swain uh, all sent donations in for this episode. So their donations, along with our uh, annual month subscription donors, as I say, uh, they pay our hosting costs and uh, everything associated with the website and the digital group, etc. So we really do appreciate their very kind support. You can uh, do what the guys did and, uh, as I say, everything, all the subscription uh, uh, listeners do. And uh, a very simple task, and you go to icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. And think of the value you got from our show today. And no matter how uh, big or small you may think it is, it's the value you found from the show. And uh, you can send it our way to help us out uh, with our project here at the ICQ Podcast. Well, we're going to continue uh, on with our show and generate that uh, wonderful value with the content that we're going to be discussing today. So we're going to be joining uh, the two Martins, Chris and Bill, to discuss and generate thoughts about the latest Amateur Radio news, including uh, Yota Month coming up and Learning Radio Does Matter. As always, hope you enjoy. Well, hi guys and welcome to episode 403 of the Ask You podcast and tonight's roundtable for that episode. Tonight, we're a bit short on the ground, but I'm sure we'll bring you some very, very interesting uh, stories anyway. I have Mr. Chris Howe with me, M0TCH. Hi, Chris. And good evening, Martin. Good evening, guys. Very nice to be on the podcast again. Yeah, yeah. And you're not very well, but you've turned out, so I'm pleased I, you have. Um, I have full-on band flu, so a very, very serious variant, I'm afraid. So uh, I'm a, if you hear a sudden thud, then you know what's happened, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Is your good lady giving you grief and telling you it's man flu then? No, not yet, but I've only, it's only suddenly happened this afternoon, so uh, hopefully it'll be a short-lived thing, we'll see. Bit of a head cold, really, but there you go. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, you feel better as time gets on fairly soon as well. Also, wishing to get me into trouble most of the time, is Mr. Mike Ruffle, M0SGL. Don't worry, Martin. I don't think anyone will notice that blatant edit point at the beginning when you tried to episode, introduce this episode as episode 300 and something. But uh, yeah, 413. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good evening. And um, my, my sympathies to Chris, because everybody knows that, that man flu is a very, very different kind of flu to any other that exists out there. The only thing worse than man flu is man COVID. Oh dear, yeah. I just I, I did a test for that, and so far I'm okay on that. I think. But yeah. Exactly. I mean, where do you even get the man COVID test from? If if the man says he has COVID and he wants the attention, you just rub, rub his forehead and say, "Poor fluffy bunny." <laughs> there you go. Sit at home, watch CBBS. You know, whatever you want, it's all good. I tell you what, I knew I was looking pretty ill when I had COVID because Mrs. Beef. To me, she was like running around looking after me. It was quite quite strange. Normally, it's like, how long did you eat that out for? A couple of weeks. How long did you eat that out for? A couple of weeks. Um, not quite, but you know, we you, you've heard of DIY, haven't you? Do it yourself. Yeah. Yep. In our house, you have DIY. Get it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. No, no, no. That's a bit naughty. I'm only joking. She's a lovely lady. I've been married to her forty nine years, so. Uh, I should know. That's code for she's in earshot. Shh. Shh. Yeah. And sorry, we haven't forgotten you, Bill. We also have Mr. Bill Barnes, um, WC3B. Hi, Bill. Hi, Martin. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, good evening. I'm sorry we were wittering amongst the three of us. It's the old British thing, you know. Can we do that now and again? It's all good. 
Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, Frank can't make it tonight and neither can Leslie, but uh, they hope to be back for uh, their next episode. So uh, I think it'll be a good one anyway. So moving on and start seeing what we've got. I know it's a, a, a way, way away, but I kind of think that we ought to be thinking about this. Yota month, Youth on the Air, is December. And if you think of it, we're almost at the end of September. So it only gives us October and November to plan things for our clubs and one thing or another. And I think we probably all really ought to make the effort to help in the Yota month. What do you think, Martin? Well, Yota month, the, the opportunity, we always say it's good to see the, um, the you know, an opportunity for the younger generation get on the air. It says you can get your club, your school or social group in, involved. I'd be interested to see who takes this up. Typically, I always think, isn't it just the usual group of people that get, uh, that get involved with this, the, the same groups of uh, like the scouts and the, the, the cubs and things that, that have radio amateurs in their midst already, which in, re- in reality could be getting them involved in it anyway. It would be nice, I'll be honest with you, it would be nice to see a national organisation, and they know who they are, actually go out there and start promoting this to other groups. Start promoting, reach out to the schools. Take, for argument's sake, a token fee that people could pay to be along to you, like £56 a year. Put some of that money towards promoting this, reaching out to new schools, to, to new organisations, organisations that haven't taken part in this before. And so look, how can we help you? How can we promote this, this hobby, this interest to you? How can we get youngsters involved in not just radio, but electronics, engineering, that, all the sorts of stuff that are tied in with amateur radio and promote it? I, I just, I'm, I'm a bit sad that I think it will only be the same groups. It's great that the groups are getting back on the air, but you don't need a month. Like, you can get on the air at any time. Well, you should be able to, and yes, I agree on that. And... You don't need an excuse for it, is what I'm saying. No, that's true. But it, I, as I've said many times, if you've got a reason to do something or a plan to do something or you're doing something as a group, then it's more likely to happen than you say, I'll go out Saturday and I'll operate for about four hours. And Saturday comes along and you've been hijacked by the rest of the family and that never happens. So, Yeah, no, I don't disagree with that, but it would be nice to, to have perhaps – more people coming in to, to experience it and to, to, to get on the air as well, I think. Not just the same people. Don't get me wrong, the same people, no problem with them coming on the air and, and having an excuse to get on the air, but it would be nice to have newer people and more people experiencing the hobby too. Well, I'm hoping that Ofcom's proposals that they asked us to vote on come into fruition fairly soon because we've got Jota coming up as well with this, uh, Jamboree on the air. And I'm involved with that this year as well. So I think uh, it could be interesting. Bill, does uh, Yota month happen in the States? Yeah, it, it does. It has the last couple of years. It's usually a special event call sign. Last year, I think they split it up. So it was some prefix and then one call sign ended in Y, one ended in an O, the other one ended in T, and then the last one ended in A. And if you worked all the stations at least once, you got a certificate. So it was a nice special event, and I, I, I think it's nice they do it every year. You know, I, I understand what, what Martin's saying about, the, you know, oh, it should be all the time, but sometimes you just need to, you just need to do a special event with a special call sign to, to drum up a little business and, and give folks an excuse to get on the air. Well, we know let, uh, that uh, Edmund will be on the air. Any, t- any excuse to work a special event station, our Edmund will probably be fairly busy. But, Chris, maybe this is something we can do Monday nights in December at the Scout Hall and maybe talk to some of the scouts that we've trained in the past and see if they'll come up and operate. I mean, I think it's certainly something that groups, youth groups like the Scouts and Guides and other other groups can can get involved, you know, Boys Brigade and other groups of this still going. Other groups can get involved with, and it, when we say youngsters on the air, who's been looking at this on the internet, they actually mean people up to the age of twenty six. So you're not necessarily need to be that young. You can, you know, you can be a, you know, in your twenties and still be classed as a youngster in terms of this events. 
it seems to be something that's mainly around IARU Region 1. Region 1 being Europe and kind of Africa and Middle East kind of areas. And so it's not just a UK thing. It's certainly a much, much, much wider than that. And they are, the idea is during December, they put on these special event stations for people of that age group to, to, to operate. And some of them are, you know, I've certainly worked a few of these stations in the past. Some of them are actually pretty good operators. These aren't necessarily just kids that are, you know, doing this a greetings mission. These are actually people operating, operating a radio and a special event station in their own right. There is also a Yota, a Yota camp, which moves around the countries each year. I think we had it in 2017 here in the UK. Uh, generally, that happens in the summer. And yeah, it was in, I think it was in Hungary. I was going to think now, it was in Hungary this year, back in the summer. And that's kind of organized and managed by people, again, within that age group. But no, I mean, I think it's a great thing. Uh, I think it's worth us talking about this now, even though it's September, because you know, if you're thinking about getting involved, now is the time to start planning for it. You know, maybe talking to your national society about being able to perhaps get access to that call sign and, and, and be able to, to, to activate that perhaps during that, that month. So certainly the UK call sign to listen out for in December, and I'm desperately trying to find it now. Is in the notes, isn't it? Uh, GB, sorry, here we go. Yeah, GB23 Yota. So GB23YOTA, as in youngsters on the air. So either if you are a youngster or you work with youngsters or you're, a, you're, you're, you're licensed and want to look at this, then perhaps contact your national society and see if you can, can operate that call sign or activate that call sign during December. And if you're not someone in that category, then listen now, there's lots of stations on with the, the name YOTA Yota in the in the call sign during December, and I'm sure that they'd love to work you. So, uh, yeah, that's it from me on this one, Martin. Yeah, yeah, as I say, yeah. it could be very interesting and to, to work as many of these as we can, and maybe we might be able to do something ourselves at uh, Sutton and Dream. Don't know. We'd have to investigate that. But uh, all being all, I think, uh, you know, any promotion in the hobby is good. Now, I have no apologies for this. I ripped this straight off Dan Romachek, KB6MU's uh, blog post. And Dan was saying, yes, learning amateur radio does matter because there are people out there, and he was finding that, there have been some very stupid questions been asked. Well, okay, I'll rephrase that. There's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only stupid answers. But it seems to be that we may be getting a large number of black box operators that really don't have the knowledge. Bill, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, I really, I really like this article when Dan put it up. The other day on his blog, a lot, a lot to think about as he's describing, you know, what he's seeing. But my initial reaction when I read the the blog post is that, yeah, you you really need to learn, you know, about how radio works, even if it's just from the safety lens. You know, you could get hurt with the RF burns, and then you know, likewise, learning about electronics and electricity. Depending on what you're doing, you know, you need that. You need to understand that so you don't get hurt through from like an electrical burn. So I understand what he's describing there, and I but I, I agree with him that yes, it really does matter. You really need to learn how this stuff works. Just to, even just for the, you know, from my point of view, just the safety part. The other thing that I you know throw out there is, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I think this is year. Th- 32 and i still learn new stuff every year so it's not like you learn the stuff once and and then and then you just put that on the shelf and forget about it it's it's really a continuous learning process with 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 the advancements of radio and stuff and how propagation works and it's just it's just so interesting it's it's difficult for me to see very many folks that don't want to learn about it but the description that dan gave it's i i know i've run across one or two folks like that in the past that just they just want to turn it on and it works but there's there's so much to it i just don't know how they have 
success or fun with it, you know, without trying to learn something. Yeah, I agree with you, mate. And certainly in the UK, we were issued our license for the self-training in radio, not just to have a nap with your mate down the road. You can do that on other types of radio. But And I know we do communicate with people, and that's nothing wrong with that. But it is the UK license is issued for self-training in radio techniques. And I think... You know, it's, it's a bit of a sh- a bit of a shame if people don't have an understand or don't want an understanding. You know, the, I got asked a very very interesting question from an M7 I met on Sunday for the first time, and he was trying very hard to get information back. And this is somebody I believe who's been thinking about it, and everybody else had pooed him. Said, oh, "Go away! Don't be silly." but because they hadn't thought the answer for And Chris and I discussed it on Monday night after, and we came up with the same conclusion we did with the guy. And that was, he said, if you were in a spaceship halfway out to the moon, could you communicate with the Earth or a station on the Earth with HF? And where he was coming from is, and I said, well, it depends on what frequency you're on and it make it in time of day and all that sort of thing. And he said, but would it not refract off the F layer and instead of going through, reflect off? And he, and I thought about it. I thought, you know what, mate? You're right. I've never thought about that. But That I is think- such a great question. It is. and Because it- it, it, the F layer goes, it's spherical around the Earth. Think of the angle that it would come off at yeah that's a, that's a really clever question yeah but this guy was serious about it chris you discuss it with me what do you think that this sort of thing so back to the question about actually knowing about radio to have a radio license to be able to use radio i mean obviously to get a license you have to pass exams and you have to know a, a certain amount of knowledge of radio now i guess over time if you passed your amateur radio exams 20, 30 years ago, you might have forgotten a lot of that stuff. And as you were saying, Martin, you know, the purpose of amateur radio is around, in fact, I just Googled it. If you look at Ofcom, it talks about its, you know, purposes for self-training, recreation, and public service. So, yeah, absolutely, training is part of it. And knowing how radio works is kind of the purpose, you know, that's why, that's why we do it, I suppose. It's a bit like having a car, you know, you can get in a car, you know, open the door, get in, drive it. You need to know a bit about how a car works. You need to know what, you know, what, what, where the engine is, where to put the oil, where to put the windscreen washer fluid, where to put the petrol, where to put the air and the tyres. You know, you can't just get in. And you need to know at least something about it. So I think it's the same with radio. You need to have a, at least an idea about how the, 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 the technical parts of the, the, of the solution works. So, um, and we're done on this one. But like I say, I think everyone should know that anyway because they've got a licence. So unless they've somehow got a licence without taking the exams by some other route, then, or, or they're forgotten, then they shouldn't know this stuff anyway. Yeah, but sometimes, as you say, Chris, the, the, the enjoyment is when you get something to work and you experiment and, let's face it, every amateur is always looking for the best antenna in the world. And even if we found it tomorrow, we'd still be looking for something better because that's the inquisitive nature of the hobby it's the learning it's the understanding curiosity, curiosity. yeah yeah and, 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 I, and I, well i was going to say i think you you will just certainly get more out of the hobby the more you understand about the underlying technology the underlying concepts that that make radio work yeah yeah and going forward it just it just means i think it's a lot more important that people do this mine i mean i know you like the guy's question but you know it is te- it is about learning isn't it absolutely i mean the, the the question itself is 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 blown my mind but the the also the fact that not only he's come up with that question the fact that he's gone out there and actively trying to to seek an answer to that i've got to take my hat off to him because you it, it's it's something you know okay you're never going to do it you're never actually going to need to know that but if in theory yeah i mean so it's, it's a great question i love it the example given in dan's blog post one of the examples that a person didn't un- basically didn't understand repeater shift on his radio, couldn't work out why the frequency changed when he pressed the PTT. Now, to me, that's basic because that's something that they teach you on the foundation course. 
And okay, maybe you did your course before repeaters were a thing. I don't know when repeaters really started making coming big, but maybe you did your course before that. And I, I, okay, I get it. But equally, if you've had an absent, you know, if you've had an absence from radio for a while, at what point should you think about refreshing your memory, retaking your test? What safety things have you forgotten? And what new safety things have come out that, hey, we've discovered that this is really dangerous and maybe you didn't know that? Maybe this is something that needs to be looked at, like a, a refresher course or something like that. Now, when I did my advanced exam, I did it with Reading Amateur Radio Club. There was a G something um, guy on the course. He had a G, I forget which number it was. And, uh, he had his license. And he said, you know what, I've, I've, I've had my license maybe 20 years. And I've just forgotten so much, you know, I've not been on the air. I never really got a chance to use it. I've come along to this course to refresh my memory and to, and to bring it up to date. And I thought that is such a great, you know, idea to do, you know, okay. You could argue that, that clubs can bring, help bring people up to, to speed, but there really does. I think there should be something that is almost like a refresher course you should take, or at least even just a, like a CBT an online thing that you just have to watch through every 10 years or so to make sure you're, 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 you're still, know what you're doing you're still safe i started out you know wanting to be a black box operator but i'll be honest with you the more i play with stuff the more i want to learn and if i don't understand it even if it appears to be something that might be faulty ask the question you're right and there's no such thing as a stupid question it's only the you know stupid answers and stupid people that give stupid answers and if you don't know youtube and google are your friends and if people are coming back with silly answers then Really, they shouldn't be answering questions. They should be referring you to someone who does know or someone who might give a better answer than them. Yeah, I agree with you. And I'm I'm hoping to go to Dayton next year. And I hold an extra license in the States. I hold W9ICQ. I've got to tell you, and I'm being brutally honest about this, I can't remember half of the licensing stuff. I'm going to have to relearn the licensing stuff before I come out. Because it is different to the UK. But I've always argued there's a lot of stuff that you should know, safety you should know off the top of your head. Yeah. The licensing stuff, okay, how much power am I allowed to run on this band? Yeah, you probably should know that, but equally you probably should be able to look it up. But it's also this other stuff that you, you have to know to pass your exam. And actually, I don't agree that you need to know that to pass your exam. You need to know that, or you need to know how to find out the information. Okay, you've got to do this. What are you going to do? And then you need to know where to look up that information. You need to know how to apply it. You don't necessarily need to know it off the top of your head. So what you're saying is it should be an open book exam, but... To some extent, yes. We, to, to certain subjects, not all of them. Safety is, you know, you should know that. You, that should be ingrained in you. Yeah. No, I just say, I think that I will have to... I, I'm going to uh, revisit and reread the licensing part of... Uh, before I come back out to the States because it makes sense and I want to behave myself and be do the right thing. Why? Why do you well, behave yourself? You've never behaved yourself yet. Oh, right then. Well, <laughs> give, him, give him three cups of coffee, he's anybody's. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hey, one last comment. Somebody you said a little earlier about the HF coming back through the atmosphere. I know I worked satellites back in the 90s. I want to say AO7, but that doesn't sound quite right. But it was two meters up, 10 meters down. And I know I worked a satellite at one point that was two meters up and and, uh, 15 meters down. So at least through at those frequencies, you could come back through the F layer with no problem. And those satellites were very high. They had huge footprints that, you know, I think AO7 was almost, you know, anything anywhere on, on the, the footprint was pretty much anything that was, it was directly under, you know, all the way out to the, to the curves of the earth, huge footprint on those. Do you know something you, you, you mentioned something about running, you know, having 10 meters and 15 meters in space, a question that I genuinely had when I first got licensed I always thought that all HF had to be Earth. And my question to that would have been, how did you get an Earth to that? But of course, I didn't, you know, at the time I hadn't quite got my head around balanced antennas and things like that. And so, you know, simple questions, but, you know, it's, ask the question and you get, get the right person to give you the answer. Otherwise, I'd have said, how do you get an Earth cable up to space to run that? 
And uh, the other crazy thing is I, 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 I started doing some, some searching quick here, but I could have swore that there was like satellite recommended bands for like 40 meters and 20 meters too. But I can't, I can't find that one off the top of my head here. But I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, I'm guessing, Bill, as I said to the gentleman at the time, it does depend on the frequency you're using. It does depend on band conditions. It does depend on the time of day and all those sort of things. So, yeah, I've forgotten that you, there was uh, ten, certainly 10 metres down. And I've forgotten about 15 metres, but down. But I think it would be... You know, it, it, it's one of those things that it could be either way, and you've proved it can be done. Ah, RS-12 and RS-13. Yeah. I found but, it. Yeah, but the gentleman didn't have – it was a, just a generic question, um, and it wasn't frequency specific. So I think we gave him a fair answer. Yeah, t- 15 meters up, 10 meters down on RS-12. Uh, 15 meters up and two meters down on RS-13. Do these satellites still exist? Oh, no, they burned up. I think they burned up a long time ago. Because I'd love to give that a go. Our, our, yeah. Let me see it. Let me, let me ask the, uh, the search. I'm pretty sure they're long gone. Yeah, I'd like to see Budgie's 15-meter Yagi pointing at the sky. <laughs> that, that's that's the joke was is yeah i used i used a, a, a dipole and it was it was a mess <laughs> it was one of those things that i didn't think i could, it actually would work and it did but your dipole side onto the sky anyway isn't it and the idea of hf is is going up so why not well according to this article it, it just it gave up a it was launched in 91, which I remember that, and it, and it went out of service in 20, 2002. Well, to the gentleman that asked me the question, I'm sorry if we've clouded it. Yeah. You, did so you, did the, you give him a podcast business card? Is I he going to be listening? one of my cards. But nicely, nicely, uh, hopefully we haven't clouded it any more than we have had. And that's the beauty of our hobby is that, Theoretic, sometimes the theory doesn't actually always work. Sometimes things work when you don't think they should, and it, it keeps our hobby interesting. And great question. We've gone off at a tangent, but as I say, keep, keep positive and uh, go forward, and I hope I'll meet you again sometime. So there you go. I should have taken your name. I, I apologize. Right, moving on. So, the next news story. The World Radio Conference 2023 will impact amateur radio satellite service. Now, there's two things it's going to affect. 23 SEMs and 10 gigs. So, uh, oh, Chris, do you want to go first on this one? Well, I mean, it's, it's upon us, isn't it? It's happening very soon. Is it... Um... November, isn't it? November and December in Dubai. We've got this conference. This is not an amateur radio thing. This is a, a radio thing. So it's all radio users. This is the, the ITU getting together. All of the national regulators get together and, and they have this conference. It's all about agreeing and voting. And there's a lot of preparation goes into these events. I remember interviewing a couple of guys from the RSGB two years ago at uh, Friedrichshaven. Now they actually don't get to vote at these things, but they are they do their they are there to influence. So the the IARU, the International Amateur Radio Union, they are representative at these at this event, and the IARU represents say amateur radio and and our, our national societies. But it's the national regulators; they're the ones that go along there, and they're the ones that get to 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 agree these things. So there's a number of there's a big agenda. The agenda is something that's talked about for years beforehand, the things that are going to be talked about. And then there's lots of lobbying, lots of, of, of influencing going on. And that's what that's what the IARU do in our behalf and our national societies that form part of the IARU 
in small parts are that's that's what it's about it's about influencing these regulators to allow us to use the frequencies that we do and every time there's one of these conferences there are changes and you know we've got the likes of the IERU that are there to represent amateur radio and to try to minimize the impact on amateur radio in fact even to maybe improve our lot now in this case there's a, there's a few and a lot of the other guys talk perhaps more about the specific things on the agenda but one certainly is around 23 sems and this galileo satellite and some potentially some restrictions that we might have and there's some other ones as well but i'll, I'll pass it back to you martin and you can perhaps talk about some of the specifics around what's on the agenda this time yeah yeah well as i say they're looking at the frequencies 23 sems because there are satellite services about to go live there and the galileo satellite and in fairness I remember doing some IT work for a group in Crawley or back in the 90s before I became a radio amateur. And in fairness, looking at this, I mean, they would have known that amateur radio people would be on it. And I'm sure there were transceivers around at that point in time that were on 23 SEM. So I thought they might have gone higher, but who knows? Martin, what's your thoughts? Well, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you. There are genuinely still people out there using 934 megahertz CB radios, and that became illegal 98, 99, something like that. I think they withdrew it and sold it to Vodafone and Cellnet. I don't use 934. I did back in the day, but I know there are very active Facebook groups and stuff promoting its use. So, you know, if someone has the equipment and stuff to do it, struggle to stop people doing it but i suppose if people are using their call signs you know who it is so maybe it's different in uh, in the amateur world of course you know the authorities the powers that be they want the gigahertz band demand for radio spectrum is at absolute premium gigahertz uh, prime real estate especially in with the demand and things for high speed internet on people's mobile phones and things like that I do wonder, though, there's a comment here. So, um, as in, in most microwave allocations, the amateur service is secondary and must avoid interfering with primary services operating the band, even if they are introduced later. Now, a lot of our radios and stuff, you bear in mind that a lot of amateurs, okay, some will be using cheaply made transverters, but some will be using highly filtered, highly well-made radios for the band that, don't suffer interference from other services and can filter out other services that might be trying to use the band. If I don't hear those other services, how do I know that I'm not, in, how do I know that I'm interfering with them? Equally, if those services are only running low power and physically aren't making the trip over to me so I can hear them, I might be running a bit more power and completely obliterating that service in unintentionally. How do I know that I'm causing them interference unless someone reaches out and says, hey, you're causing us interference on this. You need to stop straight away. Well, I'm not sure, mate. I think they'll probably have to tell us or they'll talk. They'd have to reach out, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was saying before we started, my radio technically can do 10 watts on 23 SEMs. My collinear has a gain of 10. That is... My, if with 10 dB gain antenna, that's the equivalent of a 100 watt transmitter going out. So, uh, hmm, interesting. I, I, I'd, uh, I'd go quite a way with that, I would suggest. It, you know, and these satellite receivers, I'll lay money that the front end of the satellite receivers are going to be as wide as a barn door. And even if we're transmitting, away from them uh they'll hear us unfortunately on my single antenna on the roof my collinear on my roof with 10 watts on 23 sems i've worked farnham from southwest london and that's well past guildford and that's that's i don't know how how many about 20 30 miles and it's yep. just 10 watts yeah so interesting bill what's your thoughts on this one no i agree with uh martin and chris so far that hope it works out for us and yeah it's uh you know we're we have secondary allocations in there and you know on the 23 sims and you know they were they're gonna want to protect their receivers that's one thing that keeps floating around every few years we'll 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 have a story that we share about a regulator 
talking about, you know, defining certain spe- minimum specifications for receivers. But this, I mean, there's such a large install base of this, these kind of uh, things out. They'll never get them all swapped out if that's, if that is a quote unquote solution. And yes, the, the 10 gig band, you know, mobile services want it for, for internet, for, uh, you know, mobile internet. So they'll keep making the push at the international level. So we'll hopefully it'll work out. And the other thing I wanted to mention that no one else mentioned, the conference goes from November 20th through December 15th. That is a long time to be hashing out, you know, basically worldwide, you know, radio issues amongst the various countries that participate. That that's that's a long conference. Wow. I'm guessing, Bill, that they would, say, do a certain band of frequencies one day and thrash everything out of that, and then a certain, a, another day. And if you're particularly interested in your country, you attend the band of frequencies you want. I would guess, and that's probably why it's so long, I would suggest, Bill. I don't know, but that makes sense to me. So, yeah. Right. Uh, next news story. And... I'm not surprised at this at all, but it's come up and it's worth mentioning. And it says here, US military is exploring wideband communications above 100 gigahertz. Now, I would suggest they're probably not the only ones. And I'm surprised, I'm not surprised this is happening because if you want to, um, you know, get yourself away from people and uh, with a little bit of security on this, you're well clear of most people's listening capabilities for security. Bill, it's a US story, so I'm going to get you first on this one. If, what do you think? Yeah, this, this is kind of puzzling, um, to me at least. It, I mean, it makes sense somewhat. It's, you know, over 100 gigs which are bands and states over 100 gigs is 122 to 123 gigahertz, 134 to 141, and 241 to 250, and everything above 275. So I'm not sure what, what parts of that they're looking at. It has to be line of sight. Oh, no, it doesn't have to be. In my mind, I'm thinking that this has to be line of sight but because it's in the gigahertz range you can make the band the bandwidth as wide as you need for data transmissions and the the moisture and if i remember the moisture in the atmosphere attenuates signals at that at those frequencies so this has to be short range point to point stuff but it's 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 actually mind boggling and I know, I know you're thinking, you're imagining, you know, encryption and other kinds of security uh, protection on top of those signals, you know, may or may not be needed. But I, I'm still assuming they're going to use the same kinds of stuff that they use at lower frequencies. It's just this gives them a bigger channel for wider data signals. So they might still be using the same protection encryption software they're using somewhere else but because it's above 100 gigahertz they can do things like you know multiple gigabyte networking maybe so you know I'll, I'll it'll be interesting to see where some of this stuff comes out it's you know it's it's coming through the the, the u.s air force research lab so i'm not sure if we'll ever hear anything about it but um They've done experiments in the past that we've we've heard about, like the over 300 gig stuff. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. And hopefully there'll be a follow-up story in a couple of years um, with maybe some things that they learned about those bands. Yeah, as I say, I'm not surprised about this um, because I'm sure various organizations and military will be doing all sorts of tests all the time. And uh, what you raised, the, a very interesting one to me was, and I hadn't thought about it. And once again, this is the beauty of our hobby is it makes you think the moisture content of the atmosphere being an attenuator at those frequencies. I knew from my very early days when I used to go out with the microwave boys 
that on 10 gigs you would get rain scatter so um you could aim your your dish at a uh at somewhere where it was raining and the raindrops would scatter your signal and bounce it here there and everywhere so very interesting that one bill very interesting chris what's your thoughts on this one yeah, it's not clear from the story what the application is. What is it that what what's the problem they're trying to solve with this? It might be they're just exploring where this might be useful. Right, so it might be this is a solution looking for a problem, um, and that's fine. It might just be that they are saying you know looking at it from a technology or a, or a, yeah a radio perspective. What where could this be useful? Rather than saying we've got this specific problem, we have for example we can't get enough you know um, data throughput. For example, we can't get enough. We can't properly secure our communications. Rather than take it from that perspective, they're saying, "Well, here we've got a potential solution. Let's go and find where this might be useful." Maybe. So, I think it's still at the early, very early days, and I think they're just trying to see how this might be useful, particularly around military applications. So, don't know an awful lot about it. I'm assuming it's going to be around high bandwidth, so high, uh, as I think as Bill was saying, having you know perhaps gigahertz, gigabytes, gigabit connectivity potentially i don't know having a very high bandwidth in terms of data bandwidth data throughput capabilities maybe but perhaps with some limitations you've already been talking about perhaps around you know distance that can be traveled and, and how it might propagate etc and how it might be attenuated by different media so yeah it'd be interesting to see what they come up with it sounds like they've been doing some work for a while but yeah i guess it might be something that uh that that may have a, a long-term future that, that that could be of interest we'll have to see yeah, well, I think uh, you know we won't uh, hit, we won't hear a tremendous amount because this will probably be covered by various military um, patterns and all that sort of thing. But in the long term, this stuff will eventually ripple down to us, and we'll find out more about it. It's probably when they're above five hundred gigahertz, we'll hear about the one hundred gigahertz signals. But an interesting one. This. And it may well be that, that often when there's a lot of investment in a particular area, but at a space race where a huge amount of money was spent uh, in developing some technology, you know, as a byproduct of that, some of that trickles down to consumer electronics and maybe to amateur radio. So you never know in the future, we might be doing some something around these bands. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah. Martin, have we left you anything else to say on this one? I'm just thinking like the kids' toys operating at 300 gigahertz, you know, that's where you're going to end up at, isn't it? They talk to each other. I mean, I still wonder what the, the like the military satellites and things they were using at 200 megs are for, but yeah, 100 gigahertz, I, you know, like as I said, what's it for? You know, in my head, that's radar and things like that that you'd be using that for. But the, the thing to me, in my head, surely you need to have a lot of power to make this useful. And bear in mind that they're telling us that our mobile phones and have been telling us for a long time that our mobile phones that run at 900 megahertz, 1.8 gigs, 2.1, 3.4 gigahertz are unhealthy and not good for your brains and all that. And they're running what, a watt, something like that. How much power, you know, at 100 gigahertz, and even this even mentions 300 gigahertz, how much power are they going to be running here to make this useful? At which point, health issues? No, thank you. Don't know that I want to be anywhere near that like the other said it's you know it's it's being it's u.s military i think this might be about as much as we actually get to hear about it but if anything else does ripple out i'd be very interested to see uh, to see where it goes that's for sure yeah so all in all as you say i don't think we'll be told everything well but uh, i think certain things will come out and companies that are developing stuff for these these bands will eventually uh, ripple down and will maybe, probably not in my lifetime, but have transceivers quite happily on these sort of frequencies. But I do uh, listen to you on the uh, concern of safety. So I do, I do agree with you on that one, mate. Right, move to our last news story. And I'm going to get Bill to go first on this one again because it's uh, another good one. The U.S. government have blocked the salvage of the Titanic wireless. So effectively, there's this company that wanted to go down and re remove the wireless shack and transmitter and bits and pieces off the Titanic. And the U.S. government stopped it. I think it's a good thing, Bill. What do you think? I agree as well. Um, one thing I didn't know before I read this article was that 
the, the Great Britain and the U.S. government came together and had an agreement that the the Titanic is a uh, memorial gravesite. So, as far as I'm concerned, anybody that wants to remove anything from the from that site is basically grave robbing, <laughs> and that's not cool. And it's a the salvage company is based in Georgia. They were, they were going to recover items, and uh, U.S. attorneys, or attorneys for U.S. government, has basically uh, sued them to stop them from doing this. So, you know, the this is not the first time, apparently, either. Um, if I remember, they, this group tried to go down and, and recover some items before, and they were... Um, stopped before so i'm wondering if uh if they'll <laughs> they'll back off from this and try again in a couple of years and hopefully third time's a charm or something but i still think it's it just seems wrong to go down to a grave site and, and remove items and even if they did what what kind of shape would it be in after a hundred and some odd years of being you know miles deep in the ocean with salt water and pressure and it has to be like almost at least the metal pieces almost I would assume would be rusted away to almost nothing at this point. I'd be very surprised if it was pre- you know preserved at that depth. So, yeah, it's 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 good that they stop they seem to stop them at this point again, but man, I just don't get it. No, I didn't. I only got the grave robbing bit in my brain and I thought I don't like the, the sound of this. Mine, what's your thoughts on this one? Um, well, the wording interests me. Challenging a company's plans. Let's just stop there. A company, a commercial operation, who are likely to profit from this. Who the hell has the right to profit off of something like this? Why do they want it? Well, if it's not for profit. If recent events, and I'm talking about events in the last couple of months, have taught us anything, the Titanic wants to be left alone. I mean, there's a comment here, agreement with Great Britain that the ship should be treated as a gravesite. Yes, taking it would quite simply, as you, as you say, would be grave robbing. I understand it's an interesting thing. People might want to see it. Personally, I completely support this block. Please, just leave them be. Yeah, I think I agree with you on that one. Chris, have we left you anything to say on this one? Yeah, a little bit. So I remember back in the 1980s when they found the Titanic, I think it was back in 1985, a guy called Bob Ballard, he led the team that um, that found the ship. And, and I seem to recall, I think I watched the documentary, he was very much that, leave the ship alone. You know, this is where, you know, one and a half thousand people died or certainly on the ship, you know, went down with it. And, uh, you know, his view was certainly that it should be, uh, it should be left, uh, let, you know, left be. However, there have been lots of, uh, companies gone down there and salvaged uh, items. I know, in fact, I remember going to an exhibition and there were various plates and things and, and, and things that had been retrieved, which which I kind of agree perhaps should be left alone. There's a huge amount of interest. There's something about the Titanic. Uh, obviously, there was the famous film about 20 or so years ago with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. And I think that may have uh, revitalized interest, but there's always been something very interesting about the Titanic. The fact it sank on its main voyage, it was uh, full of people that were both poor and extremely rich, and they were all kind of a level playing field when it came to uh, surviving the uh, the sinking. Definitely something about the Titanic that that's, um, that, that, met, that has a huge amount of interest. So, yeah, clearly people want to go down there and try to, to make some money out of it and just do a bit, little bit of Googling. Yeah, there have been things that have been brought up and sold for huge amounts of money. So there's definitely a, an industry, in fact, uh, a collection here. Um, a company called RMS Titanic have been down there. Oh, sorry, Inc. Sorry, have been down there a number of times over throughout the nineties and early two thousands, and they've they've collected lots and lots of artifacts, dinner plates, um, top hats, um, all kinds of things, and they've they've valued what they've brought up at about two hundred million dollars. So there's a lot of money to be made. But I mean, yeah, I, I think I'm with the other guys. I think you should be left alone. I think you know you can watch video. They've been down there with these remote submarines, and they can they can kind of almost do a guided tour and video of the ship as it stands today, which clearly is a little bit different to what it was a hundred and something years ago when it sank. I think the seas had a, an impact on it, and I think eventually it will ultimately just completely disappear. It'll just rust away, and there's very little left. Um, 
But uh, no, I, I think we should just leave it be. And I think as for the radio, yeah, I guess the radio is an important item. It's what it's what brought help um, to the people that did survive. You know, the people in the lifeboats that managed to uh, to get away from the ship in the lifeboat. It, you know, that radio and those signals that were sent out from the ship all that time ago were what summoned help from nearby ships, and that saved a lot of lives. Um, but I'd still think that the radio should be, you know, it's not going to, as, as Bill was saying, it's not going to look like it looked 100, 111 years ago. It's going to look like a very rusted item, item now. And I doubt you it's going to be, you know, it's never going to go back on the air unless it's completely rebuilt from, from scratch and most of it's replaced. So I would say leave it where it is. It's done, it's done its job and it's where it should be. Yeah, I agree with everything everybody said. And the other thing is it was probably a spark gap transmitter in fairness, and that'll never be go, go live ever again. And it, it, was, it would be very basic radio equipment. And I know radio was in its infancy then, and it was very important. But like of all the guys here tonight have said, let them rest in peace. And uh, I think that's our last words on that one. Well, that completes the news round table. Let's find out what the guys have been up to. Mine, what have you been up to? I've had a few bits and pieces going on. I had an issue recently with my hotspot. I run a slightly higher powered hotspot than the standard 10 milliwatt, and they're 10 milliwatt MMDVMs. And uh, I have it connected up to my uh, colonia on the roof, and it wasn't working. I just couldn't understand why I couldn't hear it in like less than a quarter of a mile from my house. It turned out... Um, I have it wired in with a switch box so I can switch it to the roof antenna um, or a lower antenna, depending on what I'm doing. And uh, it turns out the switch box uh, had, has an issue with it. So I took that apart, put some contact cleaner in it, and that brought the SWR right back down because it was on 10 and then it's gone right back down to like 1.1, 1. 1, 1. 1.2. Um, but I think that does need a little bit more attention, but it was uh, interesting uh, troubleshooting that nevertheless. Quite a few contacts on HF recently, some quite nice contacts i did put a few calls through on um the ssb field day i was looking for g g7 was sac or g2xp whichever Sutton team we're using but uh, you were probably too close to hear anything but i did uh, give away a few points there and uh, for me that's saying quite a lot because i don't believe in contests but uh, it, it was interesting listening because uh, obviously some you know the bright spot that came up with the idea has uh, put it on the same date as another contest so listening to uh, the two different groups of contesters get angry with each other as they're calling each other and getting told to go away was uh, was was interesting. And uh, the other thing, my uh, my fo- I've, had, I've had some great contacts on four meters recently, and um, sadly my four meter transverter has failed. It's got no TX output power. I've got absolutely no idea why. But I took it apart to um, just see if there's anything obvious in it, anything obvious that it gone pop or burnt out or anything like that. And uh, the thing that got me straight away, it was made by Spectrum Communications, and I've had this for maybe 15 years. Spectrum Communications is like a one guy down in Dorset. I believe he runs out of his house. And the thing is immaculately well made. It's, he's obviously taken great pride in building this thing. And uh, he, you know, he used to build them commercially, but uh, I can't even work out how some of it went together. So uh, that's something I'm going to have to uh, look into see if I can figure. I'm guessing it's, you know, it puts out very, very low power but it's capable of 25 watts, and I think it's pushing out a few milliwatts at the moment. So as I can hear it on the other radio, but I can't hear it. You know, There's nothing getting up to the antenna. But I might give him a call and see if he can point me in the right direction. I believe he's still going, but I don't think he still makes those anymore. But uh, yeah, other than that, not much else um, going on. Well, it seems like you're having fun, and uh, you'd probably be able to get a circuit for that. It sounds like you're probably uh, the PA stage is not working. It's uh, running. You hearing from the driver? Probably, yeah. I've, I think I've got the circuit dome. He does supply that with it, oh, yeah. um, so I have got that. But <laughs> it's above my level of understanding. Maybe I'll have a look at it with you at some point in time if, okay, if you need, need help on that one. But that's a good one, Bill. What have you been up to? Well, aside from working and uh, chasing kids around. Let's see. September 11th was the first anniversary of my friend Dave KY3W's passing. So that was kind of a bummer day, but I decided, hey, how do how do you honor on our cool dude? So I got on the radio for quite a bit on September 11th. As soon as I got out of work and stuff, I ended up 
I end up getting down on 12 meters FTA. I worked a couple stations SSB, worked one station at CW, and then I, I worked like 17 Japanese stations in a row and two Brazil stations and the Samoa Islands. But very, 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 very huge run for me into Japan on FTA on 12 meters. And then the next time I, you know, I turned the radio on was probably last night or the night before and same deal. Uh, uh, 12 meters FT8 was hot, worked a couple stations, including, uh, now I actually didn't have pick up Belize on 12 meters before. So that's another click on the DXCC and, uh, got one up to 17 meters and I worked, um, Madrea Island, same deal. So that that kept me busy. Likewise, I swapped the microphone cable on the KX3. So I uh, I started having trouble where it was cutting out last time I was up at the picnic table. And uh, as I was making calls, it was the I could see the audio cutting in and out. And I wiggled the cable and I you know did the normal troubleshooting stuff. So you know, I metered the thing out later on with the, the multimeter and sure enough, you know, there's, there's a break in the cable somewhere. And so I, uh, I dropped a note to Elecraft and they, uh, they had us, they, they had a spare part. It's not a normal spare part that they carried, but they had one hanging around there and, uh, shipped it off to me and I'm back on the, back on the air at the KX3 on uh sideband. So that was kind of, unexpected repair that turned out very well. I also built on the microphone. So somebody had some plans online and so I 3D printed a square microphone case and put in a electric element in there and that also works on the KX3. So now now I have some now I have some spares and some options. And I printed out another one of these uh, microphone cases and I'm going to make another one here just so I have a few. While I have the soldering and iron sitting out on the workbench and, and get that buttoned up, so I have a few things I can throw in the the soda backpack. Yeah, sounds like you've been really, really busy, Bill. Put me to shame, I'm afraid. <laughs> Chris, what have you been up to? Um, yeah, it's been. A, I always forget how far long it's been since I was last on an episode of the podcast. So I'm glad that Martin reminded me that it was SSB Field Day. So yes, we, as a club, we as we do every year pretty much we entered the ssb field day contest which is a club activity that we do so we've got a, a very large tent that which sits in my garage the rest of the year and we went out a different location this time we went out to a field a huge field that we had access to a couple of the guys at the club managed to get access to and uh, yeah it was great fun i took the camper van so i was all right i had quite a nice comfortable time other guys have tents and things for overnight stay the contest is 24 hours so we kind of do it in shifts uh, so i think we were doing two hour shifts and four for two hours operating the radio and four hours uh, resting throughout the 24 hours in sort of doing it in pairs one person logging and one person operating the radio then we'd stop around so we kind of took it in terms doing operating and logging and, and as Martin Rother was saying, it, it does coincide with the contest. So there is the all urgy contest that happens at the same time. And it's quite nice to hear that we do actually manage to uh, listen, hear, and, and actually occasionally accidentally work Asia from, from our, our modest station running 100 watts in the UK. So we did pull up a couple of fairly tall fishing pole uh, masts and then uh, my link dipole across them. So pretty simple, basic wire antenna but uh, yeah it worked pretty well i think we made 325 qsos which i think is better than the previous year i think it was 265 in 2022 so that was quite nice now that may be a combination of better operating better uh, aerial possibly better conditions but uh, yeah it was uh, it was it was always it's always fun to do that and it's also nice when we get some of the guys coming along that haven't done it before Gives them a chance to actually kind of get on the air and see what it's all about. So that was that was good. Martin, you and I and a few other guys from the club also went to the, and I'm going to do air quotes now, secret nuclear bunker. And there's a couple of these in the UK that are now public and I think have been sold into 
public private ownership so you can go along and no longer kind of uh, pacified or you know super top secret places but essentially there's one in a place called Kelmwood and Hatch in Essex in the UK which is kind of northeast of London um, and, and as a club I think it was about eight of us went along something like that and fascinating place quite scary in a way and quite depressing actually so you, you sort of park up at this this place you walk along a path and then there's a quite a small house and uh this looks like a normal house you walk in the front door and then there's a big tunnel that you follow along and this house is on the bottom of a hill and this tunnel basically goes right inside this hill and there's it's it's, it's massive inside there's three floors there's it's all inside a faraday cage the, the walls are so many meters thick of solid concrete um and it's it's depressing in that uh, what's inside there is all the things that would have happened in a nuclear war. So lots of things around uh, monitoring where explosions may have happened, where the where the impact was, and then the kind of what they would do about it, which is, I mean, you know, well, I don't know, a lot, a lot, really. There was lots of videos to watch uh, that were from back in the 19, well, during the Cold War, so 70s and 80s. I think it was built in 1951. Um, not a huge amount of radio stuff there. And uh, there is a big radio tower on top of this hill, and I think that's used. So, the, in fact, there's actually a BBC radio station inside this bunker. And I think the idea, idea was that if there was a nuclear explosion, that would be where they would broadcast to the nation. They'd be, you know, giving advice to people and telling them what to do, or some kind of official stuff from the government. So, fascinating place, quite depressing in that, well, thankfully, it was never needed to be used. Very interesting, nonetheless. On, on Not necessarily particularly radio. They were, although interestingly, there is actually a, uh, a software defined radio at Web, Web SDR inside there. You know, we know it's in a rack there, and you can tune into that. And then finally, just being playing a bit more with SDR Connect. So I think I spoke on the last episode, uh, and I think it's been announced that SDR Play have announced their preview version, or in fact, they've released their preview version of their new software, SDR Connect which is pretty much a complete rewrite of their software for their SDR, so their RSP products, um, so their hardware, basically. And, um, yeah, it's very good. I've been using it remotely, so that one of the big benefits of, of this new software, and we talked about it last time, so we will go into too, into too much detail again, but essentially it's now multi-platform, works on different uh, operating systems, Linux, Windows, and Mac. And you can also remotely um, you can remotely access it, so you can have a, a client connecting to a backend server running this SDR Connect software. So I've actually now got a Raspberry Pi that sits in the shack, a Raspberry Pi Four. It, it's running the 64-bit version of the operating system because it only supports 64-bit OSs with SDR Connect installed. You put that in, you start it up in server mode, and then I can then remotely connect to that from pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, you just need to set up port forwarding on your on your router, and uh, away you go. So that's that's been great fun. Been playing with that, and I'm sure that's sort of the preview version. I'm sure when they re- release the the uh, the first proper version, it will be even better. So yeah, all good. That's it from me, Martin. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've been having fun as well. So uh, that was a good one. And as I say, I was with you and the guys. Uh, down at the secret nuclear bunker, <laughs> not so secret anymore. And I think, yes, there was a lot there to see. I think it was worth the money. They charge you a £12 uh, visitor's fee. Well worth the money. It took us a good three hours. But I did find it a little bit depressing. Maybe it was because the dull lighting in there. Maybe because it was a subject. But... I still think it was worth the trip, and uh, it certainly educated me, which was good. The, I haven't done a tremendous amount of radio, but I was playing with something I built in the very early 80s. I bought this from uh, Radio Shack or Tandy in the UK, and it was an Archer project board, and it was a divide by 10. Well, it's uh, called a time-based generator, you start it off with a 10 megahertz oscillator, and then there's all these divide by 10s on a rotary switch that you eventually go from 10 meg down to 1 hertz. And, uh, yeah, it was interesting. Unfortunately, it didn't work when I got it out of the box the other day. Now, I'm not sure, and I could have, it could have been me, could have been me because I could have uh, put it 
put 12 volts up it and they are TTL chips. So five volt, I might have put 12 volts up it. I don't. But anyway, eventually um, went looking on the internet for the circuit. I know I had the circuit somewhere in the house, but in which box of um, paperwork it was in, I didn't know. And I spent time searching all over the internet. Couldn't find it. Not at all. And this is probably stuff pre the internet stage. So eventually I found it. went looking in my, um, my, my archive and eventually found the circuit. Fixed it. It's an, uh, there was a 74LS90, that, uh, a divided by 10 chip that had blown. And it was the first one in the stack. So it killed the oscillator. Well, once I pulled the, um, once I pulled all the uh, divide by tens out, the oscillator started. Then I started plugging the divide by ten chips in, and I, fortunately for me, I didn't um, make a note of which ones I pulled out of which socket because they're all the same. And uh, it started working until I put this one chip back in, and that stopped it. So I've now got a replacement chip that goes in this weekend. But the other thing I would urge you guys to do, if you have got some weird circuit like I did with this one, I uh, scanned it and I uploaded it to the Internet Archive because hopefully if anybody else has problems, they'll be able to find my circuit, my whole manual for it up there. Now, it's, it's fairly obscure, but I was looking for it. And the only other place I found on the Internet that, had it was a couple of uh, gentlemen that were trying to sell the manual online um, in, in the States. And they wanted $20 for the manual plus $20 shipping. And uh, I thought, nah, no. Nah. So I've offered it to the internet, uh, li- the internet library. Hopefully they'll use it. Yes, I've been on 2 and 70 from the car, as I always have, and a little bit of talk group. Not as much as I'd like, but I have had a few contacts on that. And last but not least, I've got a problem with my HF antenna. So I've got to go up on the roof and one thing or another. And we haven't had particularly good weather recently, so I've been mega hot or or raining and horrible windy. So uh, Mrs. B is uh, on to me about, you do not go up on the roof until there's somebody here with you or I'm here and all these sort of things. So. In the near future, hopefully before the winter happens, I'll get my HF antenna working. So uh, that's all I've been up to. So all that's left for me to do now is to thank the guys for coming along and uh, spending the time with me before we move on to the other part of the podcast. I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, guys. Another uh, another great episode. Yeah, good one. I'd like to thank Martin Ruffle, M0SGL. It's been fun, and you got yourself into trouble. Don't blame me for that. All right. All right. Yeah, I'd like to thank Mr. Bill Barnes, WC3B, uh, as well, for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. So, 73 all, and we'll continue with the podcast. 73, guys. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time for a look at the news in brief from me, Colin M6BLY. We start with an update here from WRTC 2026. Uh, They've confirmed that they've become an RSGB affiliated special interest group. Those of you who are not aware of WRTC 2026, it's the uh, UK's hosting of the World Radio Sport Team Championship, which will be taking place in July 2026. Uh, it happens every four years, like the Olympic Games, and uh, teams qualify over a period that starts uh, this October. And in the end, there'll be 50 qualifying teams, of course, two operators each, so 100 operators in total, uh, that will come together for the event. Uh, so we'd uh, point in the direction of the group's website, wrtc2026.org, for more information. 
the AWL simulated emergency test is scheduled for the weekend of the 7th and 8th of October. It's the annual national emergency exercise designed to assess the skills and preparedness of the amateur radio emergency service, ARES, volunteers, as well as those affiliated with other organisations involved in emergency and disaster response. Um, so again, it covers things like traffic, uh, weather, um, storm spotters, etc. So during the exercise, volunteers can assess uh, equipment, modes and skills under simulated emergency conditions and scenarios. Individuals can use the time to update a go kit for use during deployments and ensure their home or station's operational capabilities during an emergency or disaster. So a lot in this, and uh, we'll put a link to this on the ICQ podcast uh, webpage as always uh, for you to check that out if you wish. Right, well now we're going to head over to our features episode where we're looking at uh, the types of antennas that you use portable when doing things like uh, SOTA, POTA or hiking. As always, hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Hi guys, for this episode I wanted to talk about a few different antennas and then little things for people who do either SOTA, POTA or hiking trips out with your radio. Now, obviously you don't want to go out carrying mega amounts of stuff, so weight is important, obvious. And I'm not going to bore you with this because everybody's probably told you this in the past. So, little ideas. So how are we going to cover this one? Well, there's lots of ways of operating, and sometimes you'll operate from the car. And okay, uh, the antennas we use from the car can also help or be a disadvantage. Now, one thing we probably need to talk about before we even start this is the fact that a full-size antenna is going to work much better than a reduced size antenna. Reduced size antennas, obviously, they're there as a convenience, but they don't radiate as well as a full size antenna. And if you're out working QRP, ideally want to do as much as you can with as little power as possible. And another pet hate of mine when you're out operating QRP is using an antenna tuner. If you use an antenna tuner or an antenna matcher, then all you're doing is wasting your power, (laughs) which comes back into the antenna tuner, rather than setting your antenna for resonance. So without that, let's continue. Well, I know that if you're at work or you just want to pop out quick or you're at a shopping mall and you want to do a bit of HF, We've all tried the mobile whips on the top of the cars. And yes, that works, and you can pull up uh, in a park or something and use that. And if you suddenly arrive at a park and it's pouring with rain and you don't want to get all your gear out, then that's probably a very good idea. You won't work as well. It won't work as well, but at least you're not ruining all the rest of your gear, lugging it around in the rain, waiting uh, for a dry moment. So I've certainly used mobile whips on top of the car. I've certainly worked UK to the States, no problems, a couple of times. Not regular, but I was running QRP at the time. One of the antennas I have, and I got it given it very, very early on, it was the prototype that uh, Yesu gave my employer, and my employer said, oh, we're not going to sell these. Uh, You can have it. Interesting enough, they now sell these for nearly £300, but that's another story. Was the ATAS 25. I have an ATAS 25. That is a short antenna, a, like a mobile antenna, like the electric one that, that moves itself up and down. The only difference with this is it's manual. You have to slide it, the uh, coil up and down to get the right match. Not a problem, but once again, it's not a full-size antenna. So it's not as effective as a full-size antenna, obviously. There are various versions of these now, and I know Chris has got one, which you can screw into a mag mount, and 
what you do is you, on his one, is you pull out the uh, telescopic whip, you screw it into a mag mount, and you slide the loading coil up and down until you get a match. And yes, they work. Uh, but uh, And they could be very useful for a quick uh, operation. Now, you've often heard me talking about these here link dipoles. Very useful. They're fairly lightweight. And I like the link dipole over a trap dipole purely because you get less losses through a link than you do through a trap. And a trap obviously uh, tries to isolate, whereas if you've broken the link, you've definitely isolated the sections. So I prefer that. And they're quite nice to build, easy to build. Uh, a lot of information on the website's on that one. The other one I, I, I still like and still use a lot is my off-center dipole. And the off-center dipole is quite useful for that sort of thing uh, because it's multiband and you don't have to keep pulling the antenna down and putting it up again. But there's a lot of uh, things you have to do with all these. And, you know, going forward also, I'm a member of the GQRP club. And quarterly, we get the Sprat magazine. Now, a long, long time ago, there was a gentleman, a German gentleman, and I haven't got the document in front of me, but I'm going from memory, who in Sprat 118 showed us a hikers and bikers antenna. And what that was, was a N-fed half-wave with an L-match, a little L-match. And he built that into um, an old-style film canister and with a wire off. Now, I have used this, used it for a long time on QRP, because it works very, very well. So, how do you get them to work well, though? Well, obviously, the... Um, the one I was talking about, the MFED I was talking about, with the L match in the, in the little can, is from Sprat. But these other antennas, well, let's face it. We all know for a dipole, you need to put a one-to-one -one balance at the feed point. Yeah, we agree. We're not going to argue on that one. It should have one. And it pretty much, does what it does. It it's, um, matches the unbalanced line to the balance antenna. Now, just a thought. Nothing's ever perfect in this world. I'm suggesting that on most of these, we should use a choke balance as well. Now, a choke balance is just a uh, number of turns of coax, usually about 14, wound in a uh, particular way, and there's millions of diagrams of these on the internet that you kill off any rf coming back down the outer of the coax so a choke ballon i would suggest in conjunction with a one-to-one -one ballon at your dipole is probably about some braces but probably a very very useful thing to do and that way uh, you're not going to get interference uh, at your radio and hopefully no RF burns off, off your radio if things go a bit stray. Now, the next one I talked about, obviously, was the ATAS. I'm going to leave that. I think that should have a choke balance on it as well, even though it's a vertical. And, uh, yeah, the link dipole. There's no reason why we shouldn't put the choke balance in as well. That's about some braces. Okay, so the off-center dipole, exactly the same. And the end fed, most important to have that there. Now, when you look at these type of antennas, you think, well, which balance shall I use? And for a standard dipole, it's supposed to be about 72 ohms impedance at the uh, feed point. Well, that varies depending on how high above the ground you are, whether you're an uh, inverted V or whatever. So it's never 100%, but it's close enough to 50 ohms and impedance. And that's why a lot of people don't bother with the, with the ballon. You should, guys, really. Now, when you come to the off-center dipole, because we're feeding it off-center, we're looking for a feed point along the dipole that allows us to run multi-bands. And but about one-third, two-thirds 
point, you'll find around about 200 ohms of impedance. If we feed our antenna there into a, a uh, 4 to 1 ballon, then great. We've now got an antenna that's multiband, and our rig is requiring a 50 ohm impedance. Our ballon does the transversion from 200 to 50, and away we go. And that's why we can use it. Now, there's other things you've probably seen on the internet. Ununs. Right, there's two different types of ununs come up quite regularly. And you're thinking, well, why do I want these ununs for? They're unbalanced or unbalanced. Well, your coax is unbalanced and they're feeding an unbalanced antenna. But, and this is the big but, there are two types, 9 to 1 and 49 to 1. And you look at it and go, God, what, what's this all about? Well, the 9 to 1 unun is predominantly used to, to feed a random length of wire. Now, this random length of wire really needs to be and has to be uh, not a harmonic of any band you're going to work on. Because if you get to any band uh, or a harmonic of a band you're working on, you will start to find that your 9 to 1 balance just won't work because the impedance has uh, gone up. And I'll explain that in a minute. So when you're looking around for uh, an antenna or a bit of wire to fix to your uh, 9 to 1 unun, what I think you need to do is um, suggest, I'm going to suggest, and Chris will beat me for this, 29 feet of wire. Yeah, I'm keeping it the smallest length, but you, there are other lengths of wire that will work and don't have any harmonic attachments to the frequency you're working on. Now, if you want to use a, a half wave length of wire that's actually cut to a half wave, for the band you're on, then this requires a 49 to 1 ballon because a length of wire at the frequency you want to work on that's uh, effectively resonant is a very, very, very high impedance at uh, the end of the, the line, around about uh, anywhere between 2,000 and 5,000 ohms. So you're trying to um, bring this down and reduce it down quite a lot. And you'll probably still need to use a tuner with some of the, the ununs because they're not 100% perfect. But then again, we're trying to operate uh, with an antenna that's uh, not necessarily meant to work at that uh, frequency uh, when we're using multiples of harmonics. So just an interesting one, balance. Well, a one-to-one, -one, you'd expect it to be somewhere around about 50 ohm impedance at the feed point, four-to-one to 200 ohms. If you had a six-to-one, it would be about 300 ohms. Nine-to-one, well, 450 ohm uh, to, uh, to 50 ohms. And 49-to-one ununs, around about, something around about 2,000, 3,000, something like that ohms to... Uh, to one so hopefully that helps and i haven't clouded it much with you the most important one though is if at all possible use an antenna that you don't need a antenna tuner for while you're out in the field because you have to carry it you have to set it up and any reflective power that comes back is a waste so uh, that's a bit uh, that's a bit of a shame when you're wasting sometimes a third of your power in the antenna tuner to um, make a contact. And if you're running five watts, you don't want to be losing a third of your power. Anyway, I hope I haven't clouded the issue. Just a short talk quickly on the types of antennas you can use and what each of the ballon and ununs are used for. And I hope this helps. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. 
Well, I know everybody enjoys a fine feature talking about antennas and certainly the wonderful antennas that you can use when you're out and about, uh, either, as I say, hiking or doing something like SOTA or uh, the POTA type of activations will certainly, I'm sure, bring a lot of enjoyment to us as we're uh, out and about uh, enjoying our wonderful hobbies. So uh, again, as always, hope someone gets something from our feature there in this episode. Well, Dad, uh, we start our uh, summing up of uh, this uh, uh, fortnight's episode uh, with uh, news of our uh, our roof uh, has uh, won an award. Yeah, she certainly has, Colin. She's run. She's become the chosen recipient of the Radio Club of America Carol Perry Young Professional Award, and. She, that's a that's a really good one, uh, Ruth, and that's for all her work she's done with, with the the uh, RAC and uh, her youth activity program that she's been doing. And I know she spends a lot of time with the youth, operating, showing things, and one thing or another. Ruth previously won the um, the RAC uh, Young Achiever Award when she was an undergraduate at Kettering University in Michigan. So I think she's uh, she's a lovely lady, and I know she works very hard at what she does, so uh, I'm quite pleased, Colin. Yeah, exactly. And uh, as I say, Ruth, congratulations not only from all your friends here at the ICQ podcast, uh, but I'm sure the wider community will uh, share uh, in our, uh, uh, as I say, our proudest of, of you achieving this wonderful award. So well done, Ruth. Right, well, as I say, um, we just need to uh, thank a few people now for this episode, episode number 413 of the ICQ podcast. We'd like to thank uh, John Reese, uh, Golf Whiskey Zero, Juliet Romeo Foxtrot, Patrick Bean and Robert Swain uh, for uh, being our very kind donors uh, this episode. Uh, as we always say, uh, those are gentlemen and our one-off donors, uh, they keep your show advert-free and allow us to uh, produce the show for you every uh, fortnight. So uh, as I mentioned, top of the show, we always do the value for value model. If you found value in what you've heard today from uh, our show and you'd like to show your support, please go to icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. And as I say, uh, no matter what size that donation is, it's what the value is to you. And it all goes into the uh, the money pot to uh, help pay the bills. So uh, we really do appreciate uh, your very kind support of the ICQ podcast. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, Chris Howard, Mike Zero Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin Ruffwell, Mike Zero Sierra Golf Lima, and Bill Barnes, Whiskey Charlie 3 Bravo, for taking part in the news round table with you, Dad. And uh, thanks, guys, for giving your thoughts and opinions on the uh, news that's going on in the hobby. Right, well, that just about uh, sums up uh, this episode of your ICQ podcast. Just one very last important thing to do, and uh, that's uh, obviously, as we always say, to uh, make uh, Mrs. B a uh, cup of tea for uh, giving you up uh, large chunks of a house as we record this episode uh, for you. And uh, you never know, maybe you find a, a treat or two uh, in the cupboard to uh, pass on that cup of tea. Yeah, well, I'm going to go and spend a bit of time with your mum, Colin, and make that cup of tea because I could do with a cup of tea as well. Uh, but I'll find her something nice in the cupboard uh, and uh, we'll sit down and uh, relax a bit. So, uh, that's a good one. Um, all left me do is say 73, guys, and uh, over to you, Colin. Yep, 73 is all. We'll catch you on the fortnight's time. 73s. 73. 73.